first, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Global bicycle tours, may I help you? Yes, thank you. I'd like to sign up for a bicycle tour. Which tour were you interested in? We have the River Valley tour coming up in June and the Mountain tour in July. The River Valley tour is in June. I thought it was in May. It actually takes place the first week of June. Oh, I see. Well, I can still do that. The River Valley tour is the one I want. Splendid. Just let me take your information. May I have your name, please? Carla Schmidt. That's Carla with a K, not a C. K A R L A. Thank you, Miss Schmidt. Address. Do you need a street address, or can I give you my post office box? A post office box is fine. It's P.O. Box two five seven, Manchester. Thank you. Okay, next, will you be bringing your own bicycle, or do you want to rent one from us? I'll bring my own. Excellent. Now we provide all the meals, so we need to know if you have any dietary restrictions. I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean, if there's any food you can't eat. Some people have food allergies, or are vegetarian, or have to avoid dairy products. Things like that. Oh, I see. Well, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I never eat meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. All right, I'll make a note of that. Now the total cost of the tour is seven hundred and fifty dollars. That much? The price includes everything: food, hotel, transportation, everything. Everything? Yes, everything. The only other thing is you'll want to tip the tour guide. We usually recommend five percent of the total tour cost. A five percent tip. I guess that's reasonable. In order to reserve your space on the tour, I'll need a thirty percent deposit. Do you need that right away? We generally ask for the deposit at least four weeks before the tour begins. The River Valley tour begins, let me see, six weeks from now. So you'll need to pay the deposit in two weeks. I think I can do that. I wonder if you could tell me something. How will our luggage be transported? Do we carry it on our bicycles? No, you leave that to us. We have a van that carries your luggage from hotel to hotel each day, so you don't have to worry about it. Great! I have a luggage rack for my bike, but I guess I won't have to bring that. No, you won't. But there are a few items we recommend that you bring. We can't control the weather, so you should bring a raincoat or rain gear. Yes, that's a good idea. And I should have my own spare tire too, shouldn't I? Actually, you don't need that, as our guide always carries some. And of course, you won't need maps either, since our guide has the route all planned. What about a water bottle? I'll need that, won't I? Yes, you should definitely have a water bottle. A camera would be a good idea too, since that tour goes through some very scenic areas. I have a guide book of that area. I wonder if I should bring it along. We don't recommend guide books. It would just be extra weight, and the tour guide knows a great deal about the area. Yes, I see. Is there anything else I need to know? I think we've covered the important points. I'll send you a tour brochure, and you can call again if you have any questions. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 2 You will hear the head teacher of a school giving a talk to parents about some new classrooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for making it along. I know how busy you all are with term coming to an end. As you know, the aim of this meeting is to show you the plans we've got to add two new classrooms and how that will affect the playground. Now, I've heard that quite a few of you are worried that there'll be hardly any playground left, but I want to reassure you that that's not the case at all. I think there's been quite a lot of uninformed talk going on, and people have started worrying unduly. I certainly hope I can dispel any of your concerns this evening. Firstly, I have a plan of what the school should look like, which I'll project onto the screen. The school governors and the developers want to hear your feedback before making final decisions. Your feedback's very important. When I've gone through the plan with you, you can ask questions and we'll discuss those queries in detail. There'll be plenty of time to tell us what you think over the coming weeks. And once the plans are a little more developed, they'll be available online. There'll be a weekly update. And once the actual construction begins, you'll be able to check progress as it happens. Personally, I'm very happy with where we've got to. I knew we had to have the extra space, but I must admit I worried long and hard about what we might have to sacrifice for it. The developers have certainly convinced me that we've made the right decision. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, can everyone see the plan now? Good. Let's start at the Balfour Road entrance, since that's where most of you come and go from. The Farley Road entrance and lower playground won't be affected at all. Now... As you come into the top playground, the two new classrooms will be on the right. There'll be a new gate and the steps down will be rebuilt. There'll be a ramp for disabled visitors too. On the plan here, only the parts of the building affected by the plans are shown. I'll explain why the hall is marked on later. So, as I said... The new classrooms will be to the right of the entrance and, as you can see, will take up very little of the playground space. We feel the Year 6 children need their own area away from the younger children. So, this one on the left of the two rooms will be the new Year 6 classroom. As you can see, there's no direct entrance from the playground. The plan is to include a small entrance area here from the playground for coats and boots and so on. Entrance to the classroom will be from that area. There will also be an additional entrance to the hall from this cloakroom so children will be able to get to the hall from two different directions, from inside the main building and 
from the new entrance area. I hope that's clear. Now, as you all know, the hall doubles up as the cafeteria at lunchtime. One of the rumours I heard was that we're planning to dispense with the cafeteria and open up a snack bar. I can categorically state that replacing healthy school meals with a snack bar is not remotely in our thoughts. The other new classroom, that's the one with the playground entrance here, is going to be an exciting new venture for us. That's because its principal use will be for the preschool and after-school clubs. More and more parents want that facility outside school hours, and we need a dedicated space to run these activities. I think there were also worries about the nursery school, though I'm not really sure why, to be honest with you. I can tell you now that the whole area on the other side of the main school building will be totally unaffected. The nursery will continue operating as it does now. There will be a couple of smaller constructions, modernisation work really, down here on the other side of the top playground. Cycling into school is getting more and more popular, so we're replacing the old bike sheds with a brand new bicycle bay. There'll be space for 60 bikes. The children's toilets will also be modernised and the children will be able to enter them from inside the school building rather than from the playground as they do now. There'll be brand new staff toilets in that part of the building too, I'm pleased to say. So, I hope that's at least started to allay a few fears. Take a few minutes to look at the plan that I'll get out of the way then I'll answer a few questions if you have any. Does that make sense to you? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is OK? Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that, although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at, uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas. And parentheses. Brackets? Y yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, I see. 
And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but you're spelling. I know, I know. But I'm working on a foreign computer. The spell checker doesn't work for English. Are you sure? Have you tried changing the setting to English? No, I haven't. Well, I should see if that's possible. I haven't marked you down this time, but, well, some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling. I'd try to get that sorted out if I were you. OK, I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Hmm. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Hmm. You've put some of the most important points there. <laughs> For example, this bit. Um, yeah, the statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. Ah. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Ah. I'd like to see a lot more on that. And the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? I exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> Well, you said it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here... <sighs> I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, it's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> just the books you actually consulted will be fine. You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. <laughs> right, OK. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear the first part of one lecture in a series of lectures about environmental issues. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture series, we have been looking at the most pressing environmental issues that the world faces. One of those issues, global warming, has become very fashionable to talk about in the past decade. Though I'm not trying to diminish its importance as a problem, it must be understood that the effects of an increasingly warm planet will not be seen for many more decades. One problem affecting the lives of people right now is the scarcity of water. The need for fresh water will only increase as the world's population grows, especially in developing countries. In the future, changing weather patterns that come with global warming will only make the problem worse. People need water to drink, cook food, shower and wash clothes. Most of the planet is covered with water, but unfortunately only a tiny percentage of it is fit for human use. Of all the water in the world, less than 3% is fresh water. More than two-thirds of that remaining percentage is locked up in glaciers in Greenland, Antarctica and elsewhere, also unavailable for human use. The water vital for life comes from lakes, rivers, underground aquifers, rain and snow. This surface water, groundwater and precipitation, is not disturbed equally across the Earth's surface. For example, Canada, which has about one-half of 1% 1 of the world's people, contains about 10% of the world's readily available fresh water. Brazil makes up about 3% of the world's population, but within its borders contain nearly 12% of the world's freshwater resources. As the economies of developing countries grow, the need for fresh water also grows. One example of this has to do with the production of meat. In some countries, the demand for beef increases when people earn more money. However, raising cattle is incredibly water-intensive, requiring about 15 tonnes of water for one kilogram of grain-fed beef. The scarcity of water has a direct impact on human life. When people are forced to walk many kilometres to the nearest source of fresh water, it may take hours away from their day. This, in turn, takes time away from school or from other productive work that helps the general economy. A number of solutions have been proposed to deal with the scarcity of water. Some of them are technological, like the construction of desalination plants. These plants convert brackish salty seawater into water fit for human use. They are very expensive to operate and maintain, though, and cannot meet the world's growing demand for water. Other kinds of solutions involve only a little technology or involve modifying individual people's habits. In a rural part of India, a village facing water shortage started collecting rainwater. A simple system allowed them to save water that fell over a large area and use it during dry periods. In the suburbs that surround the cities of developed countries, house owners are using xeriscaping techniques. The main purpose of xeriscaping, unlike traditional landscaping, is not to use supplemental irrigation. This requires the use of plants, shrubs and trees that are appropriate for the climate. In dry areas, this means planting ones that use less water. In the future, many countries will need to use a variety of these techniques in order to provide enough water for their citizens. Water security will be of utmost importance to those governments, especially in areas that are politically unstable.